This week we find out that we are new women and the new woman that you're becoming because you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So before we get into his word, let's open in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this amazing word that you have for us this evening. And I would ask that each one of us is able to truly hear what you are trying to tell each individual woman in this room about how she is a wonderful, beautiful new creation in you. And so we give you this evening, ask that you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 17, I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation. And 17 says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Boy, ain't that the truth. Uh, All you have to do is turn on the news and you'll find out exactly how true that is. But it's important to note here that the Gentiles that are being referred to here, because we all think that, okay, you have the Jews, you have the Gentiles. We're not talking about uh, the believers. We're talking about unbelievers. But what are they hopelessly confused about? Verse 18 tells us. Their minds are full of darkness. That's the first thing that we see about them. Some versions say that they are darkened in their understanding. But why darkness? Well, they refuse to have the light shine in their lives. They like the darkness. They like the sin. But the light of Jesus can fix that problem. But sometimes we love our sin so much we want to stay in the darkness, don't we? Jesus said after being questioned about forgiving the woman caught in in the act of adultery, you know, other than saying, go and sin no more. But the Pharisees go, you know, do you have the authority to do that? And what did Jesus say in John 8, 12? I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness. Did you hear that? If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Now, light is very important, isn't it? Because if our path is not enlightened, we could stumble, we could fall. Those of us, you know, we, we, uh, as we get older, we put a little more makeup on each day, right? Can you imagine if you try to put your, your makeup on it with no light? You're trying to do it in the dark. Oh, my goodness. You would look like something out of a horror flick, wouldn't you? You know, you'd have you know, your mascara all over. You know, you, you wouldn't do anything right there. So the idea is you want to be able to see the flaws so that you can cover them up. Well, no, that's what we do with makeup. But you know what? We need, to, as believers, we want to see the flaws so that we can let God cover them up. Isn't that wonderful? But notice that Jesus says, if you follow me, he means becoming a believer in him as Lord and Savior. So if you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you are still full of darkness. Now, our verse continues on to to describe what this looks like. It says, they wander far from the life God gives. Now, Webster's Dictionary says about The meaning of wander says walk or move in a leisurely, casual, or aimless way. Now, I can walk aimlessly, especially like if I'm up in the high Sierras. I love to fish. And uh, oftentimes, Jeff and I would go into the back country, and we would uh, backpack back there, and we would set up a base camp. And usually, we like to go out and, and fish in the creeks and streams and rivers sometimes. And so we would just kind of go eat kind of go our separate paths during this time, and we would just be fishing, having a great time, and I'd be hopping over little creeks here and crossing logs there and back and forth across all the streams and stuff, and then one day it was getting a little late, so I started back down my creek, and I kept walking and walking and walking, and I go, I knew our base camp was here somewhere. Well, apparently, I had gone down the wrong creek. So I was hopelessly lost. And now Jeff is, he's a great Boy Scout, and he taught me how to find my way. So he says, just find a high point, and then you can get your bearings, and then you can, you know, find your way back. And that's what I did. But, you know, it was a little, it was a little terrifying. But you see, I had wandered. I didn't mean to, but I had wandered. And that's what believe, unbelievers sometimes do. 
they wander far from the life that God gives. Obviously, unbelievers do this like naturally. It is their natural tendency. Why is that? Well, I call it they have no God GPS. They have no idea where they're going. And as believers... We also can wander away because we don't use God's GPS. So we need to stay on track. We need to follow the path that God has lightened up for us. He guides us. He shows us what to do. But how does this happen? Well, to believers and at times, actually believers, verse 18 tells us, because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. Now, two things have happened that have caused their inability to follow after Jesus. First thing is, they closed their minds. We have seen this, haven't you? I know I have, where they have closed their minds. They don't want to even hear what you have to say. They see you coming and they go, I don't want to hear about that Jesus stuff. You know, don't talk to me about that anymore. They have closed their minds off. And because they don't want to hear... Yet, the enemy takes up residence in their mind, and they are influenced by him, and they are influenced by people of the world. They are influenced by their own flesh. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us, in their case, the God of this world, who is the God of this world, the enemy, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Thankfully, praise God, who is able to overcome that, the Holy Spirit. When it's time for that person to be given the choice to either receive or reject Christ, the Holy Spirit will tell them, hey, this is true. You'd better start believing it, buddy. So the enemy can't counter that. He can't keep them blinded because God wants everyone to be saved, right? But That leads us to the second reason mentioned in here in verse 18. They hardened their hearts. Again, this malady can happen to unbelievers and believers alike. I have seen believers that have hardened their heart towards sin. They go, I want to, uh, a very, very common one is they want to move in with their boyfriend. And they go, "I, I love him. God sees us as we're married. No, but this is, these are the reasons I get. And they go, so, you know, we're in a committed relationship, and they harden their heart. The Holy Spirit's saying, don't do it, don't do it. It's only going to cause you grief. And they continue on it. They don't want to hear what the, what the Holy Spirit is telling them. So they harden their heart. They go, I don't want to hear it. They plug their ears. They close their eyes so that they don't see it in the word of God. And they harden their hearts. But what does that mean exactly? What does a hard heart actually look like? Well, there are about seven things that I have noted. The first one would be the lack of ability to remember or understand anything that God has said in their lives. They just, because they don't care, they don't dwell on it, they don't meditate it. So they don't remember anything. They either never had the Holy Spirit in them or they have decided to completely ignore the Holy Spirit speaking into their hearts and minds. Very sad. Number two, insensitivity to sin or just sinfulness. Unbelievers just don't care if they're sitting because everybody else around them is doing the same thing. Or if they are believers... They were once sensitive to sin, but now they have shut out the influence of the Holy Spirit. Very dangerous place to be. Because what does the Lord do sometimes when we're being disobedient? Like a good father, he punishes us to get us to come back to him. Number three, failure to follow God's commandments or even listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. They simply don't care about anything that God has said in the Bible to do. Number four, arrogance and pride. Boy, that's like number one on the top of the list, actually. You know, they say to themselves, I don't need God. I want to live my life my way. 
You know, I could do this on my own. You know, you've, I'm sure you've heard it all before. You probably have said it to yourself. But that's just pride and arrogance, thinking that we can do better than God. Number five, these folks are easily offended. You know, like if you tell them that, hey, you know, especially believers, if you bust them on their sin, oh, they get so mad. And you're trying to do it in a loving way, but they get very, very angry. And they lack, uh, they don't have any ability to uh, forgive. They're often resentful. Grace and mercy are completely foreign to them, not to mention forgiveness. Sometimes they feel justified in their unforgiveness and bitterness and they hang on to it. And then number six, they are indifferent to the word of God. They don't care what it says. They think it's just a book of great suggestions or it's a historical book. And then number seven, that's always unbelief and it's just drawing away from God. The results are they fall away if they are believers and if they're unbelievers, they just become agnostic or atheist. They go about their lives never giving God a second thought. How tragic. And all he wants to do is give them a wonderful life. And then when something bad happens, what do they do? They say, how could God allow this to happen? They've completely disregarded all his laws, all the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And then when something bad they, happens, they then cry out to God. How could you do this? How can you be a loving God? You know, Jesus addressed this when speaking to the people. He says in Matthew 13, 14, and 15, he says, this fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear and they have closed their eyes. So their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. That is such a sad ending because all Jesus wants to do is heal all of mankind. Because they have hardened their hearts, though, he can't help them. They have rejected him, which is the perfect entrance into verse 19, where it says, they have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Now, the best companion passage for this section of section of scripture is found in Romans verses 1 beginning in verse 18. If you would like to follow it along, you should mark this in your Bible because it is powerful. Wait till you hear this. It says, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people. Now he loves people, but he hates the sin. Keep that in mind. Who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. How does he do this? Verse 20. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Remember what it says in the, in the Bible? If, if you don't praise his name, even the rocks will cry out. They sing of his greatness. Yes, verse 21 goes on to say, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. Sounds so much like the world today, doesn't it? And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God is like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. I love that. They began to make up their own minds what God was like. I mean, look over the history of mankind. How many different gods are there? Oh, thousands upon thousands upon thousands. Listen to this. Verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. You know, all the philosophies that have been handed down through the decades. They look foolish when you look back on them. Verse 23, and instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. 
Think of all the false gods that have been made. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. In other words, they, they worship the creation, not the creator. Don't we have a lot of people worshiping nature? That, you know, God is a tree, God is a waterfall. I mean, I've heard it all. Then it goes on to say, that is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. He says, if that's what you want, I'm giving you a free choice here. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. Talking about lesbianism here. And the men, instead of having normal sexual, sexual relationships with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. They gave themselves over to just horrible acts of sin. Verse 28 goes on to say, Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backbiters, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy they know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. They don't care. They don't care. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Problem with people who are sinning is they like to have people join their club. Sin loves company. But that is truly a sad commentary on what the world was like back then. And you know what? We've gotten worse as the centuries have gone on, haven't we? And it's what the world looks like today and more. But, but God, I love it when the Bible says but. Verse 20 in this week's scripture. But that isn't what you learned from Christ. What haven't we learned from Christ? Well, the things that were mentioned here. Minds full of darkness, wandering from God, hardened hearts, living a life of sin, See, that isn't what we have in Christ. In fact, just the opposite. He says, therefore, verse 21, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. I love that it says, throw off your old sinful nature, kind of like throwing off dirty clothes. So I got a story uh, it happened about 31 years ago. Jeff and I were living in Austria, and they had busted a sewer pipe. And the day had come to fix this, and they were going to have to dig a hole, get inside this manhole thing, the sewer thing, cut the pipe out, put a new pipe in there, right? Everybody was told, and the whole facility, it was at a conference center, to whatever you do, don't flush the toilet, okay? So poor Jeff is down in the hole. He's fixing the pipe, and guess what happened? Somebody flushed the toilet. They weren't listening very good, were they? So what happened? Okay, use your imagination. So Jeff bolts out of that hole, runs to our little apartment, and he's just throwing off his clothes because he's covered in filth, <laughs> you know, and he couldn't wait, He's a, you know, and he was in the shower, it, it, the fast stuff I've ever seen him, you know, he was so disgusted, I mean, he was covered in poo, so, <laughs> I know, there's a visual for you, but, uh, of course, and then he hands me the clothes, you know, he just kind of throws it in this, on this bag and stuff, and I pick it up, and I just took it to the dumpster, threw everything away. I was not going to even stick that in the, wa in the washing machine. It was too disgusting. So that's kind of the visual I got. 
It's like we want to throw that, that old nature off. Like it is filthy because you know what? It is. It is filthy. We must desire to throw off our old life because it is covered in filth. And we need to throw off our old nature and anything associated with it. You have some old clothes from that former life, you know, a little tight mini skirt that you used to go to nightclubs in, throw it in the dumpster. I don't care how expensive it was. You don't need the temptation in your closet, right? If you have some old music that reminds you of your old nature, throw it away. It's not worth it. Old movies, throw them away. We don't need to give the enemy ammunition to tempt us with, do we? Verse 23, instead, I love it when he says instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. See, when they say instead, that means you're about ready to get a really good tip. And what is the tip here? Renew your thoughts and attitudes. Let the spirit do this in you. We must surrender to the Holy Spirit and let him do the work in us. Psalms 51.10 tells us, create in me, he's talking to God here, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. See, David knew that his heart needed cleaning, so he, has, he asked God to clean it up for him, to renew him, to make his heart clean again. How do we do this? How are our minds and our hearts and our attitudes renewed? This is a process. None of us have arrived yet. Even if you've walked with the Lord for 100 years, you have not arrived until you are perfected, until you go home to be with Jesus and you now have a new body. But until then, 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. What a wonderful promise that is. Romans 2.12, excuse me, 12.2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. There's a good tip. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for your life, which is good and pleasing and perfect. It's perfect. God's way is always perfect. Why do we ever fight against it? I don't know. It's our our sin nature, I guess. Colossians 3.10. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. So let's, let's go over this again. So how do we renew ourselves? Number one, recognize that you are a new creation. You are no longer tied to the old life. You could leave it behind. Don't drag it behind you. That's what we do sometimes, don't we? Well, you never know I'm going to need that old life. And so you've got this baggage that you're dragging behind you. You see, Jesus saved you, and you are now one of God's children. You are completely a new person. You're a child of God. Number two, don't copy the world anymore. That's what Romans 12.2 said. In other words, don't do it just because the world is doing it, whatever the it is. You can fill in whatever temptation the world holds for you, but you should not be copying what the world does. Don't follow the customs of the world. You're now a child of God. Number three, let God transform you. Remember what David said? He told God to renew his heart. We must surrender to the Holy Spirit so that he can renew our heart and our thoughts and our minds. But what does that mean? We need to do what the Holy Spirit says. We need to do what the Word of God says. If you're a child of God, you have that still, small voice in you directing you and guiding you. 
I recently had a, a good example of that this past week. Now, I love Instagram, and it's on my phone, and whenever I would get bored, I'm waiting in line, you know, uh, uh, I recently had to sit and and wait for my dog while she was in the vet, you know, and so you get bored, so what are you doing? You're looking at Instagram, and pretty soon you're just scrolling through all the stuff, all the suggestions, you know, which I think are all traps, you know, and I was spending way too much time doing this, and so the Lord said, I want you to take it off your phone. I'm quite... Wait, wait, wait a minute. What am I going to do when I'm bored, okay? There are times when I'm just waiting around. There's nothing to do. I want to be able to scroll Instagram. No, take it off your phone. No, okay. I must not be hearing him right. I mean, what's the harm in Instagram, right? And so we battled for like two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, and I'm miserable. And so the Lord started putting things on Instagram that were just making my heart ache. For some reason, I mean, it wasn't anything really crude or anything like that. But, you know, I was looking at suffering people and suffering animals. And, and I was suddenly bombarded. And finally, the Lord just says, are you going to listen to me now? I want you to take it off your phone. I go, okay. So I took it off my phone. But, you know, I would have saved myself a lot of grief had I just taken it off when that Holy Spirit said, take it off. You don't need it. I don't want you to be caught in that trap. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Number four, put on your new nature. That's what Colossians 3.10 tells us. So take off your old nature like dirty clothes and put on the clean clothes. This takes effort. This takes self-control. Okay, funny story. It's not even in my notes. It just popped in my head. So I usually say, okay, Lord, you want me to share it? Okay, I'm not going to tell you which son did it, okay? <laughs> so one of them went in, filthy, you know, boys are boys. They're always dirty, okay? So he goes in, he takes his bath, he comes out, you know, and I, I have to ask. I go, so did you put on clean underwear? And he says, I didn't have to. I'm going, Oh, come on, please. Of course you have to. No, Mom, I just turned them inside out. It's like, no, 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 no. Okay, go in your room, get a clean pair of skivvy drawers, and then put them on, okay? You need clean clothes. But this is not what we kind of, okay, you know what? I can keep it. I'm just going to kind of wrap it in a cleaner package, right? Not that they're clean, but it's like, wow. I go, that is just like us, isn't it? We need to put on new nature, not try to change the old nature to look a little bit more like Jesus. Can't be done. Can't be done. Number five, our last one, get to know your creator. That's what Colossians 3.10 was telling us. How do we get to know our creator and be like him? How do you get to know anyone? You have to spend time with them. If you don't spend time with Jesus, you're not going to get to know him more and more. How do we spend time with him? Well, I know I beat this drum a lot. Go through the Gospels. You get to know Jesus more. But you also have to be in fellowship. You have to be reading the word. And you have to be talking to him, listening to him. Prayer is more than just you putting out, okay, Lord, I want this and this and this and this. There also be, needs to be some time of listening, doesn't it? You need to be listening, spending time with him. Then you'll get to know your creator. All right, going back to our scripture, verse 24. Put on your new, new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Now, we just read in Colossians that when we take off our filthy clothes, we need to put on the clean clothes, right? Likewise, we take off our old nature. We must then put on our new nature. And don't worry. We have the Holy Spirit helping us in this process. We have the helper. That is a promise that Jesus gave us, that when he went to heaven, he was going to leave the helper. Remember, we always have help in this endeavor. Ezekiel excuse me, Ezekiel 36, 26 says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will put within you, put, and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give your, 
you a heart of flesh. So what does God say? Listen to that. I will give you, I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit. I will remove the bad heart. God does it. It's all about God doing the work through us. All we have to do is surrender to him and allow him to do that. So what are some key takeaways here? This week, this study has been all about becoming the woman that God wants me and you to be. The question is, do we really want to be that woman? That's a big question. Sometimes we like our sin, don't we? Our lives as believers are all about allowing God to rule in our lives. And when we do that, that's when we have victory over that, that old nature. And you might be saying to yourself, well, I'm not sure I want God or anyone having power over me. That used to be my heart. Well, I had to do the math. So let's look at some of these things. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Oh, okay. Now God can give me a new heart because it says here, my heart is deceitful and wicked. 1 Corinthians 1, 25 tells us that even God's foolishness, if there is any foolishness in him, which I don't think there is, is wiser than man's wisdom. God can give us his wisdom. 1 Corinthians 125 also tells us that God's weakness, if there is any, is stronger than any man's strength. God will give us his strength. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we see that we are saved by grace. We can never work hard enough to earn the grace because it is a gift. He gives us everything. Our conclusion then? Well, we need to face the fact that we can't do any of this on our own. In every situation we have in our lives, God wants to supply everything that you need. Everything that you need. I mean, can you imagine that someday we will always, when we become perfected, when we're in heaven with Jesus, we will always make the right decision. We can make good decisions today if we listen to the Holy Spirit. We will have all the wisdom that God wants to give us and grace and forgiveness. Can you imagine always being loving to those around you, never sticking your foot in your mouth, never saying something mean? Someday we'll be perfected, but until then we have the Holy Spirit to help us do better. Always having joy, peace, and contentment. That is what God is offering us. All we have to do is allow God to make us the new woman he has promised to make us. We won't always do this perfectly, of course, but we always have God's grace to renew us and pour out his love on us and make us a new woman as many times as it takes. So let's start that process now, shall we? There's no time to waste. Even though the struggles can get intense, God is always there to support you. And the struggles are there for a purpose. They're for a purpose. It's part of our maturing process. I will leave you with 2 Corinthians 4, 15 through 18. And it says, all of this, meaning struggles, is for your own, for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving. And God will receive more and more glory. What is he saying here? Sometimes... We speak very loudly when we're going through struggles and we still have God's peace in our lives. People are watching, always watching Christians and seeing how they act. It says, that's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small 
Sometimes they don't see, seem small, do they? And won't last very long. Remember, our lives are but a vapor here today, gone tomorrow. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last, last forever. I love that. Everything God does is for a purpose. Never forget that. He's always doing it for our own good. So don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. What is he talking about here? <gasps> Heaven. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. The things we cannot see will last forever. What things? All the promises that God has given us will be fulfilled. Eternity with Jesus, heaven, fullness of joy, no more tears. All those things that you have heard that heaven's going to be like. So trust the process, this renewing of your mind. Let God make you that new woman because it's always for our own good. Do you believe that? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be your daughters and making us completely new creations. We are no longer tied to the past. No matter what we did back then, Lord, you have given each one of us a new heart, a new life, one that can glorify you, Lord. And so we love you. We thank you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.